So I still say something about the sound that wins. After, I'll do it after the first song. Yeah, we're just going to run the first song, yeah. and then after the first song... Then I'll, then I'll welcome and I'll say something else. Is there any way we can get that click a little louder? How's it in your guys? It's loud in my end. Oh, is it? Okay, not in mine. Oh, 
Well, good morning. How you all doing this morning? Just to let you know, the devil has tried all he can to prevent this service this morning. We came in here, there was no sound or anything, nothing was working. We haven't had a sound check, we haven't practiced. So we're gonna make a joyful noise unto the Lord this morning. So we need you, we need you guys to raise your voices and help us this morning. At the end of the day, it's not about us, it's not about anything, it's all about putting our eyes onto Jesus right now and praising Him for what He's done, amen. Mountains are still being moved, strongholds are still being loosed. God, we believe, and yes, we can see it, the wonders are still what you do. Come on, let's sing that. Mountains are still being the strong walls are still being loose. God, we believe. Yes, we can see it. Wonders are still what you do. We are here for you. Come and do what you do. We are here.
Jesus, we love you so much, Lord God. We thank you that we can celebrate on this Easter weekend, Lord God. And that, Jesus, we can put our focus on you because you came, you laid down your life for us, and you paid the ultimate price for us, Lord God, so that we can have reconciliation with the Father. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you for paying that price. Thank you, Lord. There was a moment when the lights went out When death claimed its victory The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in history They're on a cross they made for sinners for every curse his blood atoned the final breath and it was finished not the end we could have known before the earth began to shake and the veil was torn what sacrifice was made as the heavens roll? Oh, hail King Jesus! Oh, hail love of heaven and earth! Oh,
Hallelujah. Jesus, you're so worthy.
Lord God Almighty. It's so amazing that as we sing those words, that all of heaven, all the angels are singing, holy, 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 is our Lord God Almighty. Yes, we worship you. You're the reason we're here this morning, Lord God. We come to celebrate what Jesus has done for us on this Good Friday. We thank you, Lord, that we can put our trust completely in you. We thank you, Lord, that there's nothing that we can do to earn our salvation, but all we can do is put our eyes on you, Jesus, and thank you that you are our Savior, and you are our Lord, and we live for you with all that we have. Every fiber of our being, Lord God, we live for you. We thank you for this service this morning. We thank you that we can receive the word this morning, Lord God. We open our hearts. Let our hearts be good soil this morning, Lord God. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Well, good morning on Good Friday to every single one of you. Won't you turn around before you take your seat and just say to your neighbor, Jesus is alive. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, worship team, our tech team. They arrived this morning and they had obviously been gremlins in the system last night because nothing worked in this building. And so by God's grace and His wisdom, this team managed to pull it together. And by God's power, we were able to worship our Savior this morning. Amen. Amen. Well, this is a day we come and just reflect on the goodness of God. We're just grateful. We come with grateful hearts for all that He has done. That Jesus Christ came over 2,000 years and died on the cross for each and every single one of us. And so if you're here this morning and it's your first time, we just wanna wish you or welcome you as warm, warm welcome. And we really trust that you enjoy the service with us. I met a lovely couple this morning bringing their little granddaughter Leah here this morning. It was such a blessing. I don't know where Colleen and her, her husband is, but such a blessing to have you here this morning with us. We always love it when new people come. And um, so at the end of the service, we have a guest station out in the foyer that you can go through there. Someone will help you answer any questions you may have about New Life Church. Also, if you were watching online with us today and it's your first time, why don't you head over to our website and fill out the Connect card and we would love to be in contact with you. Well, today's Good Friday but Sunday is coming. So we have got an Easter Sunday service this Sunday at nine o'clock. You do not want to miss it. Please bring your family. It's gonna be a day of beautiful celebration. And so we want to encourage you to come along with that. The children's church will still be there. Um, NLS will be running. So come along and be a packed house here on the Sunday, this Sunday. Then on the 11th of April, we have Growth Track One, which is the first part um, really of our membership class. It's, it's, it's like the what next class. If you want to become a member, not sure how about it, you like what's happening at New Life, this is the course you need to register for. It's up in the East Wing at quarter to 11, straight after the morning service, and there's refreshments, something to eat up there. So please register for that if you'd like to find out a little bit more about New Life Church. And then Sunday the 21st, the Sunday straight afterwards, it's Growth Track 2, which is Discover Your Design. And every single one of us have been created and knit together in our mother's wombs by Jesus. And we by God. And we have a DNA. We have a personality. And we have spiritual gifts. And this is a wonderful course to come along and to discover how God designed you. Because when you know the gifts that God's given you, it's, it just gives you so much confidence to go out and be an agent of light, to, to use the gifts and the talents and the personality that God's given you to make a difference in this world for Jesus Christ. Then exciting news, Alpha starts on the 23rd. You would have seen at the back of your chair, if you wanna reach behind it, there is an Alpha card, it's a red card card. We encourage you. We don't like it when you don't take them because then we have to pick all up your cards. So we really encourage you to take your card with you because put it in your car, put it in your briefcase, put it in your computer bag because I can guarantee you over this next couple of weeks, there will be someone that you meet 
that is going through a hard time. There'll be someone that you meet that is searching and saying, what is the meaning of life? Why am I even here? It is a great evangelical tool. It, hun, millions of people have gone through it, and we really encourage you to please invite someone to Alpha for the tw 23rd of April. Also, don't forget cappuccinos after the service, complimentary cappuccinos. And then lastly, we're just gonna give you an opportunity to give. And we thank New Lifers for the way that you do give into the offering, your tithes, your offerings, your blessings, your gifts, and that enables us to do what God's called New Life Church to do. And I was just thinking at this Easter, on Good Friday, I don't think there's any better scripture than John 3.16. John 3.16, I'm going to paraphrase, because God loved us so much that He sent His one and only Son to die for us, that whoever, if any of us believe that, we will be saved and we will have eternal life. And so as we give this morning into the offering, let's just give with a grateful heart, knowing that He has given us the most precious gift, and that is His Son. And because of Him, we now have eternal life. We're going to watch some TV news and then go straight into the message. Enjoy. Life Church, my name is Fern, and I'm here on team at New Life Church in Bryanston and assist with the running of Alpha. It's with great excitement that we announce our next round of the Alpha course beginning soon. For more than 20 years, we've seen well over 2,000 people go through the Alpha course here at New Life Church. It is a free 10 week course for anyone that's exploring the Christian faith. There is complimentary tea, coffee, and a tasty treat for everyone. Alpha has been a remarkable experience for so many people, and we would love for you to invite family members, friends, or colleagues who are searching for life's big question to attend this course. Alpha is run worldwide and helped the lives of millions of people everywhere. With all the stress of life that we are facing, this is a place for people to be real, be known, and to feel loved, while asking questions like, is there more to life than this? Who is Jesus and why am I here? Alpha is a safe space to explore and ask honest questions with no judgment. We cater for all age groups, including a discussion group for grades 5 to 7, high school students, young adults, and all ages thereafter. If you would like to know more about the Alpha course, please visit our website at newlifechurch.co.za or email us at alpha at newlifechurch.co.za. See you in Alpha! everyone. For those who are joining us in person or online, welcome to New Life Church. We are so grateful that you decided to join us today. We would love to connect with you. To learn more about what we are doing here at New Life, visit newlifechurch.co.za or find us on social media. Before we hop on into today's service, here are a few things happening at New Life. God's Word tells us that He loves a cheerful giver, which is why we always need to create opportunities to give with a cheerful heart as He leads us. By giving, we partner with God in building His church and transforming lives. If you're on site today and would like to give, you can give at our giving station located in the foyer. And regardless of where you are, you can always give online at newlifechurch.co.za. We would love to pray for you. If you're on site today, please come out to the front of the auditorium straight after the service. If you're joining us online, please complete the prayer card on our website. No matter where you are, thank you for being with us today. Enjoy the service. On a hill outside Jerusalem called Golgotha, the air is heavy with hopelessness and despair. Against the afternoon sky, three men hang upon wooden crosses. On the middle cross is Jesus of Nazareth, his body battered and broken from the merciless scourging he'd endured, all at the hands of those who had condemned him. The crowds gather around, their voices echo shouts of mockery and scorn as they hurl insults and jeers at him. 
Yet even amidst their ruthless cries, Jesus offers words of forgiveness and grace. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As the hours pass, darkness falls over the hill, and Jesus speaks the words, It is finished. He bows his head and surrenders his spirit to the Father. The earth trembles and quakes, yet even in this moment of pain and suffering, there is a glimmer of hope, a promise of redemption and salvation that will echo throughout eternity. This Easter, you're invited to discover the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and to experience the overwhelming gift of grace and salvation that's being offered through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Well, good morning to everyone. I love that uh, clip. I love the fact that uh, we as a congregation can gather like this on a good Friday. Often on Fridays, we're working, uh, but this is a weekend where uh, people all around the world celebrate the most important being person in all the universe, and that is Jesus. And so a warm welcome to every single one of you for, for those who have come to New Life Church for the very, very first time. You know, this morning, I was up pretty early couldn't understand why I was up early, and I thought, okay, Chris, you just got to just wake up and pray and uh, just uh, commit the day to the Lord and just get ready for a beautiful time together with beautiful people. And then when we arrived here, obviously we heard there was a few technical glitches, and, uh, and this is what came to my heart. Today, it's about one person. It's about Jesus. And uh, there was a famous song called, When the Music Fades, and all is stripped away. It's, we simply come because it's all about Him. And uh, this morning, my prayer is that the Lord would speak to you personally. Speak to us corporately, but speak to us individually. And uh, I believe that's the most important event in all of history is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus and what it means for each, each and every single one of us. Today, I want to briefly talk about freedom. I believe freedom is so important to every single one of us. And for those who are new here, we as a church have been going through a book called Galatians. And uh, it's one of the most beautiful books about the subject of freedom, true freedom, and how true freedom can come to every single person's heart and life as we encounter the good news of Jesus. And that the gospel of Jesus Christ changes your life spiritually, emotionally, as well as spiritually, and helps us encounter a new way of living life, a life of freedom, where you have nothing to prove. Uh, You don't allow the things of the world to weigh you down. Yes, you can be influenced by them. You You still have problems, but the problems don't control you. And it's all about discovering uh, Jesus Christ. Now, when we look at the subject freedom, the modern definition of freedom would be self-determination without limits. In other words, that you and I can do whatever we want without any limits, without any sacrifice, uh, that we don't have to allow anyone to limit our progress, uh, to lay any sacrifices or ask us to do things we don't want. And that would be part of the definition of freedom. The only thing is when we look at the modern definition of freedom, self-determination without any limits, without any sacrifice, when you begin to apply that in the realm of love, in relationships, a couple who are in love, moms and dads who love their kids, kids who love mom and dad, brothers and sisters, uh, when you apply that definition of freedom, you recognize it doesn't really work because it's not allowing any sacrifices, no one's going to limit me. But if you want a relationship to really work, there are going to be moments where you're going to humble yourself. You're going to sacrifice certain things and say, because I love this person, I'm prepared to give up a little bit of my freedom in this. Not to say the person's hindering you from reaching your fullest potential, but for love to really work, for freedom to really work, I believe we've got to look at the gospel of Jesus. And the Bible gives us a brilliant, sophisticated answer to what radical freedom really looks like. 
And so the book of Galatians is the number one book, I believe, one of the, one, one of the main books in the Bible that speaks in and around freedom. And uh, Paul the Apostle was somebody who uh, despised Christ. He despised the church, uh, actually persecuted the church. And um, then he has a Damascus Road experience where he encounters the risen Christ and his life changes forever. And he then uh, starts planting churches across Europe and uh, modern-day Turkey, and there's this one church called the Galatians, and he plants this beautiful church, and they're having this wonderful encounter with their new relationship with Christ. And he writes to this church, and he says, Christ has set you free to live a free life. He says, don't allow anyone or anything to put a yoke of slavery on you. Because these dear Christians had now encountered the love of God in and through Jesus, which I believe is our greatest need to have a relationship, an intimate, growing relationship with God. And so they're discovering the joy of salvation, the joy of a new freedom, a new identity, new purpose, nothing to prove. But then these false teachers come along and they start influencing these dear, sincere Christians and begin telling them, listen, uh, you need to know this. Uh, yes, we believe Jesus is important, but it's Jesus plus other things that you need in order to discover freedom. And they were beginning to say that you're going to now follow these old ceremonial laws. Uh, even for the men, they had to be circumcised because a lot of the Christians in those days were Jews, but then there were Greeks coming to know Christ. And so these false teachers were trying to, uh, trying to enslave these dear Christians with legalism, a yoke of slavery. And Paul is now, as a loving shepherd, a loving father, trying to say, guys, please don't get caught into a yoke of slavery. The gospel is about bringing you true, true freedom. And so it's in Galatians chapter 6, he's now written this beautiful letter to these beautiful Christians, and he's summarizing. You know, like when you're writing the end of, at, at the end of a letter, at the end of the book, the author or the writer is now going to summarize what he believes is the most important thing. And that's exactly what Paul begins to do. He wants them to discover the essence of what true freedom is all about. And he says this in chapter 6, verse 14. He says, as for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. I just want to read that again. As for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified and the world's interest in me has also died. I reckon every single one of us boasts in something. We look to something to determine our joy, our honor, our worth, our value. Something that we believe makes us significant and special and confident. Every single human boasting in something. And here Paul has got to a place. I mean, he's a religious pedigree. He's an academic. He's been successful in everything that he's been called to do. But now he's got to a place where he says, listen, guys, I've got to a place where I'm boasting about one thing. Doesn't mean he's not proud about other things he's accomplished and the people he's influencing and loving, etc. But he says, this is the one thing. And so I've titled today's message, Boasting in the Cross Equals Freedom. Can you say that with me? Boasting in the cross equals freedom. There's nothing more important in history than the cross, understand the cross. I believe there's nothing more important in your life and mine than the cross. In a world with technology and sciences and advancement and all these different things, we're grateful for them. But I hope and pray that each and every single one of us would hear what the Lord wants to say through His Word, that the most important Thing in your life is the cross, Jesus Christ. And I believe for Paul, what was of central importance to him was the power of the cross, was understanding the gospel of Jesus. And uh, I believe for each one of us, if we want to really understand the cross and understand what true freedom is all about, then we need to look at what the scriptures share with us. And so the Bible talks about freedom and how the cross actually gives us the most sophisticated answer to the modern problem of true freedom. So here Paul 
says to these dear Christians, listen, if you're gonna follow this other gospel these false teachers are sharing with you, he says it's a false gospel. It sounds close, but it isn't. They're trying to place a burden on these dear Christians. And he says, you're gonna lose your freedom if you're gonna pursue anything other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even if it sounds close, if it's not Jesus only, he says there's no ways you're gonna be able to embrace the radical freedom that Christ can give us. And so how do we embrace this radical freedom? I believe there are two simple principles that we need to share from Scripture or embrace and understand. And then what we're going to do at the end of the service, we're going to listen to a beautiful song and partake around the Lord's table. I believe if we want radical freedom, there are two things we're going to grab hold of. The first is we're going to let the cross offend us. And then secondly, we've got to learn, once we've accepted that it's offended us and impacted us in the right way, that we learn to embrace it and boast in it. So let's look at the first principle. To be free, let the cross offend you. Hear this. Paul says the whole purpose of these false teachers was actually to try get out from under what the cross, cross really t- taught And because it was deeply offensive when people who were thinking people grab hold of what is the cross really saying to me? They liked the symbol. They thought it was quite inspiring, but they found the message of the cross actually offensive. They didn't want to be persecuted for standing for Christ and what really Jesus had done for the world. So they were diluting this main message because the main message of the cross, even though it's about the fact that God loves the world, that he loves you and I so much that he did something for you and I to be forgiven and reconciled to a living God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul also writes to a church in Corinth, and uh, he begins to share the fact that uh, many of the Jews in those days, they were looking for power, and they found the cross very offensive, because they believe really we need signs, we need power. He also said that the Greeks in those days, they found the cross offensive because what they believed the world really needs was wisdom. But here Paul begins to say, listen, do you know what's the wisdom and power of God to the world that's going to really bring you freedom is the cross. Understanding what Christ has done over 2,000 years ago around the same, t- the same time. In 1 Corinthians 1.22 he says, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greece, Greeks, Christ, the power and the wisdom of God. Paul is saying people are going to be f- offended in different ways, and we'll look at the two ways that people are offended. One is, here speaking to the Greeks of that day, they were known as the intellectuals in one sense. Not all of them, but here Paul is applying this principle and saying here the Greeks believe that we offended by this story of the gospel, the story of the cross, because what the world needs is not the cross. What the world needs is wisdom. And so these would be the intellectuals of our days, the educated. And so they don't find Jesus himself Uh, an offense, but they find Christ crucified an issue. That's what causes the tension in their hearts and lives. For some intellectuals, the doctrine of sin and doctrine of salvation and atonement is, uh, for some, intellectually disgraceful, morally outrageous, that how can any thinking human really believe that God would punish sin like that? And so in one sense, they don't hate the idea of Jesus. What they hate is the whole concept and truth about the fact that Jesus is the Savior. Quite happy with Jesus being a wise teacher and loved what he had to share in and around blessed are the peacemakers and let's forgive and let's not live lives of bitterness and revenge, etc. Beautiful principles and teachings. We're happy with that because if we allowed that, that wisdom, that's what's going to save the world. And so... 
the intellectual will then begin to look at the world system and say what we really need in order for us to make this world a better planet. We need wisdom. We need a better political philosophy. We need a better economic system. Uh, we need a better educational philosophy. And so the list can go on and on. But the bottom line is when you and I really look at what the cross is saying, the cross is saying the problem in the world is not lack of wisdom. Yes, to some degree it is, but the real problem in the world, this is what the cross says to you and me, if we really hear what it's saying, is that it's our hearts. Hearts have got hard, some of us have got wicked, sinful hearts. And this is the reason why some people begin to hate the cross. So here now, Paul begins to also begin to show the, uh, these precious Galatian Christians that, listen, have you ever stopped and considered that it took the death of the Son of God to pay for the sins of the world? That the presence of Jesus coming to earth in one season is an indictment on the human race. That there's a bigger, deeper issue at work within the human race. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that the world, as beautiful as it is, it's also a broken world. And there's a lot of evil in the world today. And so the cross says it's not about being intelligent or being smart enough that's going to solve this world, that you and I need redemption and a salvation and a renewal of our own hearts, which only can come through Jesus. Then Paul also begins to talk about the Jews, that they were wanting miracles and signs. And this could refer to, in one sense, the common people. They don't think it's just about wisdom and right philosophies. What they would say is that really what the, the problem in the world is, is that you've got good people and bad people. And what we need to do is get rid of the bad people in one sense, because the bad people are making this Beautiful place, a bad place. We just need more people to be better citizens. Nothing wrong with it. The Bible talks about better fathers, better mothers, etc. And let's be honest. That's what's going to save us. That's what's going to make this world a better place. Paul will say, no, no. The cross says that the cross is foolishness to the Jews and the Greeks, to the intellectuals as well as to the common people. What he does say is he says it's not just about good and bad. It goes far deeper than that. The cross says there's no difference between the good and bad people. At the end of the day, when it comes to our status, our stance before our relationship with God, every single one of us are sinners and, for, and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us, the most moral, good, upright citizen. Also, when they stand before God, the Bible says your righteousness is as filthy rags. So every one of us have blown it in one way. Every one of us have broken at least one of the commandments. And all of us stand before a holy, righteous, loving, merciful God. We stand as sinners in need of salvation, that we need a Savior. Romans 3, Paul says this. This righteousness, in other words, another word would be this right standing with God is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. That there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So here, the word is saying this, that we all need the blood of Christ. We all need the cross of Jesus. We all need salvation. If you think about what the message of the cross says to the moral and the immoral person, if you had to, if I had to say to you, listen, let's put three swimmers or three people at Cape Point, and we're going to ask them to swim to Mauritius. You have a swimmer, a person that's not a great swimmer, you have a normal swimmer, and you have an Olympic gold swimmer. The person who's not a great swimmer, give them 50 meters, 100 meters. If they don't have a rescue boat, they're going to die. They're going to drown. The good normal swimmer, he's going to maybe get 10 Ks, 20 Ks out. But eventually, if he doesn't have a rescue boat, he's going to drown. Get the gold Olympic swimmer. He's going to maybe go 50 Ks, 100 Ks more. But eventually, he's also going to drown. 
every one of them are doomed, no matter how good their efforts may be. And when it comes to our own efforts and our own performance, at the end of that, can never ever reach the standard of God's righteousness and holiness. Every one of us need the gospel of grace. Every one of us need the same blood of Jesus Christ to have a right relationship with God. And that's what the cross says, that you and I need to be rescued. We cannot reach that standard of perfection or that standard of right standing with God. And so the gospel, when you really grab hold of it, yes, it can delight you when you grab hold of the full message, but the gospel in one sense offends everyone. It offends the moral and the immoral person. It offends the elites as well as the common person, the young and old. And so Paul says that if you want to be free, you have to see the offensiveness of the cross. What is it really saying in terms of your stance, your position, your status before a righteous, holy God? And no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter where you are in this life, we are saved by grace alone, not by good works that any man could boast. We're saved by grace alone. It's absolute mercy. Everyone's welcome. It includes everybody. Anybody that will humble themselves and say, God, I recognize my greatest need is to know you, is to know your love in and through Jesus Christ, that Lord, you cover my sins, that you can redeem me and call me a true son and daughter of God. And it's not by my wisdom, it's not by my power, it's not by moral achievement, but it's by grace alone. That's why it's a good Friday. When you accept the beautiful truth of the gospel of Jesus and what it does for us, and then you begin to accept it, what it does, it can bring a joy and a delight to your own heart because you realize it's because of love. God loved you so much that he provided a plan of rescue, plan of redemption. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna get to this place where we say, Lord, I recognize what it's saying. Let the cross offend me. Lord, I stand as a sinner in need of a loving savior. But I also move from that place of offensiveness, almost like it can seem bitter, but like when you taste something bitter, but there's something sweet in the middle, that all of a sudden you tap into the sweetness of the presence and the love of Jesus. And then you begin to realize, oh God, and I accept this. I realize what I, how I stand before you, but Lord, you come to renew me, revive me, restore me, and save me. And Lord, now I boast in the cross. And in order for us to find true radical freedom, we've got to get to that place where we begin to boast in the cross. This cross, at the end of the day, everyone stands under judgment before a holy, righteous judge who is God Almighty, but he's also a loving Father. And when you understand that the cross can either offend you and you can stay bitter as a result of it all your life, or you can let it deeply transform you and change you. Paul is saying either will be offended or you'll get to a place where you'll boast and glory in the beautiful, glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. You'll either hate it or you'll get to a place where it changes your life. Maybe someone says, Chris, I don't see the cross as really offensive. I think it's a beautiful, inspiring symbol, but it's never really transformed me. I don't hate it, but it's never really transformed me. It's not really a joy to me, but it's just an inspiring symbol. Maybe, and I say this sincerely, maybe you've never taken time to truly understand what the cross is saying to you and me. The gospel can be defined this way. It's the message that we are more wicked than we ever dared believed, but more loved and accepted than we ever dared hope because of Christ. That God loves you and values you so much that he wants you to be reconciled with him for all eternity. Let's go back to what Paul's saying. As for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified and the world's interest in me has also died. What is he meaning that the world's crucified to me? He's not saying that the world is dead, but what he's really saying is this, the world has got to a place where it doesn't control him anymore. It's almost he's, the world's dead to him. The power, not people, he loves people. But the world's system, 
doesn't pull him, doesn't control him anymore, doesn't hinder his freedom. It's possible for the cross to come into your life in such a way that nothing in the world phases you at all. Even technical issues. Even load shedding. Why is it that sometimes we are so worried, so anxious, so lonely, so bored, so despondent, so depressed? Is it possible that we're allowing something to control our lives? We're boasting in something other than Christ Jesus. We're boasting in someone other than or something other than Christ and his glorious gospel. Yes, there's a balance, we human beings, and we have physiological makeup, and sometimes when you're not eating properly, exercising, sleeping too much, sleeping too little, that can affect our emotions, I get that. But Paul's going at a very deep, deep place for us in understanding true radical freedom. To a place that when you and I understand what it is to boast in the cross, that the world system doesn't influence you like it used to. Yes, you still have problems, because we live in a broken world, but it doesn't control you anymore. How does that happen? It's where you're boasting. It's who you're boasting in. It all depends on what you boast in. Paul's saying if the world is controlling you in any way, making you bitter, making you scared, making you despondent or bored, it's because maybe you're boasting in something other than Jesus. What you boast in, in, what you boast in is the center of your personality in one sense. Look what he says in verse 13. For even those who are circumcised do, know that, do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. What does it mean to boast in your flesh? Flesh means a created thing. It can be a good thing, but it's a created thing. And what's happening is you and I are looking at that good thing and saying, this is my joy, this is my honor, this is my glory, this is what gives me strength, this is what gives me confidence. What you boast in is what gives you the emotional strength to face the world. It could be success, it could be appearance, it could be your achievements, your status, it could be so many different things. The Apostle Paul He's trying to say this, that if you're boasting in the cross, the world has no power of you. And if the world does have power over us, then we've got to ask ourselves, what am I boasting in besides the cross of Christ? What am I looking to, to save me, to complete me, to make me pleasing other than Jesus Christ? If you and I are truly boasting in the cross, this is the key to freedom. Once you and I have had a revelation that we are saved by grace and grace alone, nothing you've done. Every one of us have a record of some things that we're pretty ashamed of, even the moral good, good person. But when you and I understand we're saved by grace and we now accept and boast and it begins to change everything and then we get to a place like Paul. This man had found true freedom. He was bold like a lion went through his different physical challenges, persecution, you name it. Not immune to challenges, but he lived in a level of contentment and peace and boldness and freedom. And he says, may I never boast about anything except for the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so a real Christian is not just someone who looks at the cross casually and just sees it as an inspiring symbol but it's someone who has got to the place where they draw their identity, their significance, their security, their belonging, you name it, from being rightly related to Jesus Christ. Paul says there's nothing else I'm obsessed with as my source of meaning other than Jesus and the death and burial and resurrection. It's the center of his universe. How do you and I boast as a landless? Two simple principles. A real Christian, a Christian boasts in the cross intellectually, that you and I begin to ponder and think through, why this whole universe, we live on this little planet called Earth, but galaxies still to be discovered behind this beautiful design, a creator 
a maker, a God. And here he puts us on earth to have a relationship with him. We choose to live independently of God. And as a result, all the pain and chaos and brokenness and all these things come. But he, out of love for you and I, provides a plan of redemption because he knows they're drowning. They'd never get a swim that far. I need to save them. I need to rescue them. The word propitiation is turning God's wrath away. Jesus is our propitiation. Jesus is the sacrifice. He is the one who stands in our place and says, I will be punished. I will be judged for them. And what's so beautiful about the story of the gospel is that you see there's a God who's loving and merciful and gracious, but he's also righteous and he's a right judge. But here we don't just see him acting as judge. We see him as a righteous judge. He needed to punish sin because sin has caused all kinds of havoc in all our lives. So someone had to be, paid, someone had to be judged for that. Jesus said, I'll be judged for it. But because God is so loving, he provides that plan of redemption for us. And so we see the law and love fulfilled in and through the gospel of Jesus. Do you and I boast in the cross? Do you and I see it intellectually that we realize mankind is on a way that not even wisdom, no matter how much power you're gonna try and pursue in the things of this world, it's never gonna save and change the heart of human beings. A Christian personally boasts in the cross. So it's intellectually and then personally. What am I boasting in besides Jesus? Why is, what is it I'm so afraid of losing? The moment I get into those payments, why am I so angry? Why am I so depressed? We gotta look at it and say, God, help me not boast in that anymore. I wanna boast in you and you alone. And just by changing that priority, it begins to set us free to a place where the world doesn't influence you and I like it used to. My prayer today he said, you and I will just take a moment just to pause and think through, regardless of all the challenges and problems you may be facing right now. It's a moment between you and God. Forget who's on the stage, forget who's around you. And maybe the Lord, out of His love and His grace for you, just wants you to reflect this Good Friday and make it a Good Friday for you and your home and your life and your future. Say, Jesus, you love me that much. You love me that much to do this for me. Can we just bow our heads just for a few moments? What is the Lord saying to you? To the Christian, what is the Lord saying to you? Maybe you've become distracted about different things and Jesus once said, the lying, the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches to choke what's happening inside you. There's the glorious life of Jesus. It's available to each one of us. All made available because of what Jesus did on the cross for us. And maybe there's someone here. Yes, when you've really thought around the cross, maybe it has upset you. Maybe it has offended you. But maybe you're seeing that behind that is a God who deeply loves you and wants to save you like He saved me and so many of us in this room. He loves you and wants to help you and wants to put you in right standing with a God that deeply loves you and wants to lead you and guide you to reach your fullest redemptive potential in Him. And if that's you, can you just simply say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I know that you're a wise teacher, but it goes beyond that. Jesus, you are the Savior. I need you to save me. I am a sinner. I know you love me and I'm valuable to you, but I, I need you to save me. I open the door of my heart and I welcome you, Jesus, to be my Savior. 
and to be my Lord, to be my King in everything. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Can we just remain seated? And what we're gonna do is the worship team, we're gonna sing a beautiful song to you, sing a song for us. And may the Lord just speak to you. And then what we'll do is partake um, of communion. If you haven't got communion elements, please just raise your hands and the ushers will come serve you. Enjoy this and let the Lord speak to you.
Thank you, worship team. This is a moment where we celebrate and come to the table of the Lord with great thanksgiving, great worship and thanking Jesus for what he did for you and me. And Jesus says to his disciples 2,000 years ago, I want you to do this in remembrance of me and you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so we join millions and millions of Christians today as we say thank you, Jesus, for the price paid. Thank you for what you have done for each one of us. And the bread speaks of his broken body and the cup, the new covenant, and that his blood washes us and cleanses us and forgives us and gives us a new heart. And so could we just bow our heads just for a few moments and this is between you and Jesus. Just to thank him and speak to him and just put things right and maybe just say, Jesus, I've been boasting in other things, putting my strength in other things and they'll never fulfill me and satisfy me like you will. Lord, for your forgiveness, we thank you for your peace. The name above every name, Jesus. We thank you for the bread that represents your body. It was broken for each one of us. Let's partake, let's eat. covenant, an everlasting covenant, secure in him for all eternity. It's partake. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for this moment together where we can just celebrate who you are and realize that you are the most important person in all our lives. And we depend on you for everything. I pray that, Lord, you'd be the after speak, Lord, as we go home to our different places and that you would just help us be so aware of the joy and the beauty of knowing you each, each and every day. I pray. Amen. Well, we love you all. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. If you prayed the prayer of salvation, we have Bibles to help you in your new journey with Jesus. Prayer teams will be available in the front uh, to pray for you if you stay in the gap for somebody. And then cappuccinos, free cappuccinos. And please just linger longer and enjoy company with one another. And then we'll see you on Easter Sunday for our resurrection service. Bless you all.